Okay, I believe we are good to go. Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our Wildlife Wednesday series tonight. Uh, my name is Kelsey Hansen, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator with the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. And we are going to have our presentation this evening talking about what skulls and animal parts you can or cannot keep with Riley Woodford here, our presenter. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and start going into what the flow of the evening is going to look like, as well as what AWA is. And then we will jump in in just a few minutes to Riley's presentation. But thank you everyone for being here. We're excited to, to learn more. All right. And everyone see my screen all right? Cool. Yes. All right. So again, welcome. Thank you. Um, all right. We're jumping in. Wildlife Wednesday. And this is part of our Anchorage Chapters Wildlife Wednesday series. But we have three chapters in the state of Alaska, one in the southeast based out of Juneau. And then we also have a Kenai Peninsula chapter as well, but this is part of our Anchorage series. Uh, for some guidelines tonight while we're viewing, um, we ask that you don't have any Zoom bombs, that you keep your microphone and your video off, and not only will that help with bandwidth, but it'll also help um, just making sure that there's no distractions as we are presenting and learning. Uh, we also suggest that you view your presentation in full screen mode in order to get the entirety of what is being shared. And if you have any questions, do throw them in the chat. We'll be throwing a few relevant, um, any sort of links throughout the conversation. We'll be putting those in the chat. But if you have any questions, you can put them there. And we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation here. So about the last 10 or 15 minutes of the evening, we'll be answering any questions that you may have. And most importantly, we hope that you have a good time, that you enjoy and learn something new. Um, it's, we have a lot to learn in the state of Alaska about Alaska's wildlife, and we're excited to be sharing that with you. And we hope you enjoy what you see. So the Alaska Wildlife Alliance, we are a nonprofit. And thank you to our members who are attending this evening and who um, have supported us in the past and currently. Because of our members, we're able to have these Wildlife Wednesday presentations for free for the public. So big thank you. Uh, we do education, advocacy, and citizen science throughout the state to help protect Alaska's wildlife and making sure that it's being eth ethically and scientifically managed. Um, so yeah, again, a big thank you to our members. We can't do a lot of our work without you. We really appreciate your support. Some things that wildlife, or Alaska Wildlife Alliance does, we do citizen science, education, and advocacy, like I mentioned. And so we are currently doing beluga monitoring. Um, we monitor the Kenai and Kasilak River sites, but we are part of a partnership that has several sites. Um, so you can volunteer and help watch belugas until November 15th. Uh, we also have education. So there's a volunteer of ours down in Juneau. We have some, maybe if you've been around Juneau, you've seen our bear posters on the side of the public transit system. Um, to be bear aware, we are promoting that, and we also table and have some other educational events like this one throughout the year. And for advocacy, we um, currently have a proposal to the Board of Game that'll be in January that we are closing comments, but um, we're trying to get some trail, have safer trails and get trap setbacks off of those. And then we also have, currently, we just uh, filed a lawsuit to protect Alaska's polar bears. That's just a little bit of what we're doing. Uh, you can check out some more news and what we're up to on our website. Um, these are just a few announcements, as I mentioned, um, a polar bear lawsuit and then volunteering to monitor belugas. And we are encroaching winter. Um, we have from one of our um, board members, our vice president, we have um, an interesting article of exploring the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. 
but there's plenty more to see on our website. <laughs> Some events, we have another Wildlife Wednesday in the month of October coming up, um, and that will be for our Kenai chapter, and that will be discussing whales and whale ID. So that's going to be a pretty exciting one. And some past events, all of our past Wildlife Wednesdays, including this one, have been recorded and are going to be uploaded to our YouTube page and our Facebook and Instagram and, and our website. So you can check out any of past talks that we've had if you're interested. This summer, we had wildlife walks in person, um, bears, birds, and beers. We went and saw all that we possibly could of Alaska's wildlife, including bears and moose, doll sheep, and beluga whales. Um, so it was quite a fun summer. And then we followed up with, bear, with beers at King Street Brewing Company in Anchorage. So those were Anchorage based and were quite a good time. And we currently have a pumpkin carving contest and a wildlife photography calendar contest being voted upon now. So enter your pumpkin carvings and share them with us and also go and vote for your favorite calendar photos on our Facebook page. Again, thank you so much to our members for making this presentation free and for um, our volunteers who step in and present for us. Riley is a volunteer doing this from the bottom of his heart, which we really appreciate. <laughs> um, if you are looking to support Alaska Wildlife Alliance, you can become a member. It's $35 a year. And there are also on the bottom of your screen additional ways you can help support um, but I will be throwing a link in the chat. I just wanted to say a big thank you to those who are supporting us. And without further ado, we're going to jump into our official Wildlife Wednesday presentation. So off to Riley, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but thank you so much for being here. Great. So am I... Am I on screen now? Yeah, you are. Okay, very good. All right, great. Well, before I start the uh, presentation and kind of get into uh, what you can and can't keep and why, uh, just tell you a little bit about how this came about. Um, I'm an information officer for the Division of Wildlife Conservation at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So I was primarily hired um, about 20 years ago to uh, restart our magazine the Alaska Fish and Wildlife News Magazine, uh, because the you know old print magazine had been very popular, but kind of uh, you know times changed and uh, it was very expensive to produce and distribute. And then in the early 2000s, obviously we could do things online, and so uh, we started that up. So that's kind of my main job is to do this magazine. I also do a radio program called Sounds Wild. It's on a bunch of radio stations in Alaska. It's very short nature and. Uh, animal-based uh, episodes. It's um, available almost everywhere, uh, in almost every part of the state. But I, uh, I get a lot of calls and deal with the public a lot. And I was getting, I get, would get a lot of calls about, from people asking about all these weird questions about, you know, my grandfather died and I inherited a stuffed harbor seal, or uh, I found, you know, a floating dead walrus can i keep it or can i just keep a shed antler that i found and so uh, i finally at one point decided i'll just write an article about it so i called all the different people that manage animals and animal parts and all of this and worked up an article uh, for alaska fish and wildlife news about the topic and then uh, our juno chapter um, pauline strong uh, read it and was like can you come and do a talk for us um, for our wildlife Wednesday, uh, that was the end of 2017. So, so I did a talk three years ago and I've kind of updated a little bit, but of course nothing's really changed. I mean, some of the people that might've been the contacts might've moved on, but the contact, uh, position would still be the same. So, um, so that's kind of the story, uh, with this and I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, and get into that. But I, I have been interested in skulls since I was a little kid and I was the kind of kid, you know, my brother and I spent a lot of time in the woods and fishing and, um, and we were, we would pick up, you know, snake skins, a shed snake skin or something and um, uh, find bones and, you know, fossils and things like that. And so, in fact, I have what I think is maybe the 
first skull I ever got, a little squirrel skull. It even has, still has a little bit of fur on it. And then when I was in college, I got a biology degree in college and had to do a senior project. And so I collected owl pellets from this barn uh, in Eastern Oregon near La Grande where I went to school. And uh, for a year, I collected owl pellets. I got about like five or 10 a week. And then I dissolved the owl pellets and pulled out all the skulls. And I wound up with hundreds of these little vials of skulls and I keyed them all out and got the, got the skulls. And then I figured out what kind of mice, this is a bird, this is a, a gopher, this is a paramiscus, a deer mouse and a little vole. So all these, you know, little skulls came out and I realized that you can key out anything, you know, they little things with the teeth and little aspects of the skull, you can figure out what any skull is you find. And uh, also as a kid, my dad uh, was an avid fisherman and tied flies and he taught me to tie flies. So I started collecting feathers and wings and bird parts and stuff for fly tying. And so I've always been really interested in feathers and things like that. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know, you get into that kind of stuff pretty soon. You're making plaster casts of animal tracks and all of that. And um, next thing you know, a dead humpback whale washes up and you get permission to salvage it. So uh, I'll get into how you can do that. Let me do my, share my screen. Uh, and there we are. I am screen sharing, very good. So you can all see, okay. I wanna um, make sure I can still, uh, see the, oops see the chat if anybody if anything's going on um but yeah let me know if there's a if there's a problem everybody can screen share okay it's working looks uh, good we'll shout at you if you, if you got something to ask okay yeah. all right okay very good so um i'm going to give you an overview of uh what you can find and uh how this works, uh, there we go. So the uh, path sometimes is very convoluted, but there is almost always a concrete yes or no answer. Yes, you can save this or yes, you can have this and keep it or no, you can't. Uh, there's a few things that really are important. Um, it depends on what the animal is because different animals uh, in Alaska and of course anywhere in the country are managed by different state and federal agencies. Usually it's either uh, fish and game, you know, the or Department of Fish and Wildlife or Wildlife and Parks, whatever state you're in, is the equivalent of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Or it's the U.S. and Fish and Wildlife Service, which manages uh, some animals, and National Marine Fisheries, which manages other animals. Um, so it also depends on where you find it, uh, what the who the land manager is and who you are, because uh, native people can keep a lot of stuff that non-native people cannot keep. And some parts of animals are off limits. Um, so there are permits that can be obtained. You know, museums have permits to have animal parts and animals uh, that they have in their displays. Um, I have a permit from Fish and Game to collect animal parts for the Department of Fish and Game. Uh, we get calls, I get calls often, uh, or sometimes that a bird flew into a window and there'll be like a beautiful kingfisher that flew into a window and somebody's like, do you want to get this? And I, people have called up and said, there's a bat in my house. And I was trying to get it out and I killed it accidentally with a broom when I was trying to herd it out the door. Um, do you want it? I'll go over and get it. Um, so uh, that's a avenue that a lot of that uh, permits a lot of, uh, you know, like museums and things to have stuff. Uh, but for the general public, there's, um, there's a lot of things that you can keep and you can have. So the Department of Fish and Game uh, manages um, terrestrial wildlife, you know, all of the game animals that are hunted and things like that, uh, and upland game birds. So things like grouse and ptarmigan. In a, a state like Oregon, uh, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife would also manage things like pheasants and chuckers and uh, quail birds, game birds. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages most birds, migratory birds, raptors, things like that, and three marine mammals. They manage walrus, polar bears, and sea otters. 
The National Marine Fishery Service, which is part of NOAA, uh, manages other marine mammals, and that would be toothed whales, uh, baleen whales, porpoises, uh, uh, sea otters, I mean, sea lions. So where you find it matters. Now, Alaska has a lot of public land. Um, other states is a little different. This, um, so you might, it might be that like in the Gus Davis Forelands, um, a moose shed or a moose skull uh, that's in the Gus Davis Forelands would be legal to pick up. But if it's a mile away in Glacier Bay National Park, it's not legal to pick up. This picture here, uh, can you see my cursor? This is a uh, dead humpback whale that washed up in Glacier Bay. These are three brown bears chowing on it. And there's three wolves here. There's a wolf there, there, and there. And there's one back there up in the, in the grass. Uh, yeah, this was in 2010. And that whale just decomposed on the beach. And so I, because it's a national park, those bones would all still be there. So national parks, off limits. You can't even pick up shed antlers. Um, so uh, ethnicity matters. And as you can see here, uh, Native Alaskans can collect almost any part of any animal threatened animals, endangered animals. Uh, they can make things out of them. They can possess them. Uh, there are some things that need to be registered, even by Native Alaskans, uh, if they collect them. But basically, they can legally collect almost anything. Uh, Non-Native people can collect a lot of stuff. Um, some of it must be registered. Uh, and some things you can collect. Uh, some parts of animals you can collect, but not others. So like you see there with polar bear, uh, you could collect, if you found a polar bear skull, you could keep it, uh, but you couldn't keep the claws of a polar bear. Uh, you can collect things like uh, a humpback whale bone, but not baleen. Uh, baleen is off limits. Uh, native people can collect baleen, but not uh, non-native people. Uh, And um, let's see, um, there's just a, well, I'll get into this a little bit later. There's a few other details about where, um, but basically um, to kind of hit the main high point, um, the kind of animals that, you know, you're most likely to find um, like a moose skull, like this, uh, this nice, beautiful moose skull with the rack on it, it's totally legal to keep. You can find that, you don't have to register it, you can keep it. Um, shed antlers, um, skulls, bones, all that stuff is legal to keep if you find it. Um, something like this, a roadkill porcupine, you could, uh, you could collect quills, you can take, take quills. Um, that's all perfectly legal to just pick up. Um, this is a mountain goat that was killed in an avalanche uh, off Basin Road in Juneau, just uh, a couple hundred yards off the road. It was scavenged in the month of April when it melted out of the avalanche. Um, it was scavenged by wolves. So this is what I found, which is basically fur and a lot of wolf scat and a few bones, but wolves are pretty good at even chewing up bones. Uh, this particular wool was pretty trashed, but there are times when I found nice big giant pieces of mountain goat wool and you can pick up things like that and keep it. Uh, so, you know, am animals that have been killed naturally. Um, this is a bear that was killed and scavenged. Uh, it would be legal to pick up that skull. And, uh, and then kill sites, you know, sometimes you come across a place where uh, animals have killed something and um, you need to be careful around fresh kills if bears are involved because bears will guard their kills. They'll bury them like this is a caribou calf that was killed and the bear kind of piled up uh, 
grass and stuff on top of it. And that's a, you know, potentially a very dangerous situation to stumble upon. There was a, a bear killed a moose in Cowie Meadow, north of Juneau a few years ago. And uh, people were kind of warning uh, folks about that, that, uh, you know, to be careful uh, um, around that kill site. So just because you see a dead animal doesn't mean you should necessarily walk right up to it. Um, wolves are, you know, they're not, they don't guard their kills uh, in the same way. Uh, and they're, you know, a pack of wolves is going to devour something pretty quick. So uh, a hunter who legally kills an animal can give you any part of it. They can't sell it, but they can give you the skull or the antlers. Um, they can give you meat, but there's a transfer of possession form. It's in the back of the hunting regulations. You can download it from the Fish and Game website. It's easy to it's easy to get a hold of one, and you should have them fill that out and then sign it, and then you sign it that you've accepted it. Um, it's it's kind of a technicality, but uh, it's important to make it perfectly legal. But then you can get anything from um, from a hunter, and in Alaska, if you if you shoot a bear, um, you have to seal the hide and skull, which is you take it in to uh, a fishing game office and somebody measures it and inspects it and we get biologists get some information from it. And I was at one of the sealing sites, the, the really the peak of bear hunting is the first week or two of May. And uh, a lot of bear hunters were coming into the Douglas office and I was taking some pictures and a guy had a, a nice big brown bear and uh, he was from Indiana and he, the sealer just asked him, it's like, what are you going to do with the hide? And he said, well, I'm going to make a rug out of the hide, but I don't really care about the skull. And so I was immediately like, well, can I have it? And, and he's like, sure, you can have it. So I ran inside and grabbed a form and filled it out and he signed it. And I was the proud owner of a bear head uh, or a skull. It still had all the meat on it, but it was perfectly fresh. So I cleaned that up myself. I boiled it and scraped it and all that. Um, and we have information on that. If you're interested in cleaning skulls, it's really easy to find um, out how to do that. And it's uh, it's not a bad process. It's It doesn't smell bad. It's not gross at all. It's like cooking as long as the animal's fresh. Uh, it's a little bit of work, but it's uh, it's not bad. If, if it's rotten, it's a horrible experience. And I would uh, rather pay a taxidermist to put it in a beetle um, you know, people keep dermested beetles, flesh eating beetles. Um, and they, you know, for not very much money, you can have, you can give it to a taxidermist and they'll have the beetles completely clean it up. Uh, and they just eat it and they eat it like in a week, they eat all the meat on it. And then, uh, you know, they might paint some hydrogen peroxide on it to sanitize it and it's good to go. And, uh, uh, so you can also put them in a compost and I've composted uh, skulls and, you know, animal heads and it takes a little bit longer, a few months, but it'll clean them up really nicely too. So in some cases, uh, animals must be sealed. And like uh, uh, if a hunter gives you a uh, doll sheep, uh, doll sheep, uh, skulls or horns must be sealed. And in that case, they put a little, they drill a hole in it and they put a little plug in it. With a bear, they would put a locking metal tag like is pictured here in the corner. Uh, and it just like goes through the, the eye uh, orbital. And uh, you don't necessarily have to leave it on all the time, but you, uh, you know, should keep it with it at all times if you don't want it on there. And, uh, and that just shows that it was legally sealed. And so uh, that would be something that would be kind of a, uh, a follow-up with it for those particular things. So whales, uh, they're a different matter. This is a whale that washed up on the beach down south of Juneau uh, near Lucky Me on Douglas Island, uh, a little maybe seven or eight miles from town. Uh, hump, the juvenile female humpback whale, uh, this is in 2004. So this is what it looked like in August in the top picture here. And uh, 
This is down at the bottom is what it looked like um, the following March or so. It didn't take too long to break down. And uh, I just, we put up some signs. Uh, my friend Clay Good and I went down there a few times and picked up different bones as they kind of uh, got cleaned up naturally. And we put signs up saying, we're gonna collect these for you know, uh, display, so please don't steal them. In the end, about uh, maybe 18 bones had been taken uh, from the entire carcass out of maybe 100. Um, obviously nobody moved the skull or took that, but people took a couple of ribs and a couple of vertebrae. Um, and we cleaned them all up and uh, brought them back. And they're now out at the uh, NOAA, the Ted Stevens NOAA research, marine research facility here in Juneau, what we call the Oak Bay Lab. And somebody, uh, an Eagle Scout did it for his Eagle project. He kind of created a display out of them in the lobby. So, uh, with whales, you, uh, you just need to register them. It depends on the species, but, uh, uh, generally like a, like gray whales are not endangered. So you can get, uh, gray whale bones, um, humpback whales. Some populations are, uh, managed somewhat differently than others. So in, like in Southeast Alaska, you can collect any of the bones from a humpback whale. They have been removed from the, uh, they're not endangered. Uh, and so it's legal to pick up humpback whale bones and possess them. Um, obviously the belugas in Cook Inlet are endangered. So that would be a different, um, that wouldn't quite be legal. Uh, and uh, it would be killer whales, um, harbor porpoises, things like that are legal to take. Native Alaskans can keep all of that stuff if they have it, uh, but it kind of goes, um, for the most part, it is legal to take uh, and keep humpback whale bones, which would be the, by far the most common whale that you know, somebody might find in Alaska. Um, this is a humpback whale that washed up on the beach uh, near Angoon on, uh, uh, Admiralty. There's a brown bear right there up by its head. Kind of give you a sense of scale for it. Uh, chowing down on the uh, rourke wolves there. Uh, this is uh, just south of Juneau. It washed up on a beach. Um, and actually, it's kind of surprising how uh, over the years, I think there's been five or six whales that have washed up um, just in Southeast, but these ones here, this was on the backside of Douglas Island. Um, in fact, I hadn't thought about this, but this whale here, uh, this is Dan Kirkwood, um, who's a bear viewing guide here in Juneau. And he, I went over with him, but this was right across from here. So actually this whale washed up right over here on uh, Admiralty Island. And he put a couple of trail cameras on it to see if bears would come in and get it. Um, this is a sperm whale that washed up dead in Lynn Canal, just north of Berners Bay, about halfway between Juneau and Haines. Uh, by the time the National Marine Fisheries Biologist got to it, somebody had come and stolen a few of the teeth, but, uh, but for the most part, they were able to do an necropsy on it and get a bunch of uh, tissue samples. This is a fin whale that, uh, washed up in Kodiak in 2017. So gray and humpback whales, you can take all the bones, but not the baleen. Fin and sperm whales, you cannot collect parts. And then, as I said, baleen is in a class by itself. Non-native people cannot collect it at all. Native people can. Uh, they can then sell it. And it's technically, it has to be worked into a handicraft of some kind. So you'll see like Scrimshaw worked on it, but polishing counts as, uh, as working because it can't be unpolished once it's been polished. So those big, big pieces of baleen that you might see in people's houses, those are all um, bowhead whale baleen. They're um, you know hunted in the North, uh, Humpback whale baleen is only about 14 inches long. Their baleen is not very big. Those big giant pieces you see, those are, those are uh, bowhead whales. 
and they have been polished. So it's legal for people to, you know, for native people then to sell them and for people to have them. So sea lions are kind of uh, in a funny class by themselves. They uh, are endangered in Western Alaska. They are not endangered in uh, Southeast and South Central Alaska. So it's okay to collect them uh, east of Cape Suckling, which kind of defines Cape Suckling is kind of the top of the Gulf of Alaska. It kind of, you know, would be what you consider the center of the North Pacific or the Gulf of Alaska. And west of that, you can't collect it. Uh, east of it, you can. So bones uh, and teeth, some, in some cases, teeth are considered ivory. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service calls them hard parts as in soft parts. Um, so they make the distinction that you cannot collect soft parts, which means you can't decapitate a dead stellar sea lion. You have to wait until it's naturally uh, decomposed and, uh, and uh, just bones. You can't have soft parts. Uh, obviously there might be some interpretation in there um, at what point it's considered completely clean. Um, it also has to be beached. So it's kind of a funny thing, but if, if a walrus or a stellar sea lion is floating in the water, you can't collect it. It has to be beached up on the beach. Um, the same is true with a polar bear. You can't collect parts from a polar bear unless they are completely beached. Uh, sea otters are the same, kind of in that same category in Southeast Alaska and South Central Alaska. You can collect parts of sea otters, but not in Southwest Alaska. So if there was a sea otter in you know, Kodiak, you couldn't touch it. But if it was in Southeast, you could. The fur is a different matter. That's a soft part. Uh, uh, you can't collect the, you couldn't take the fur. Native Alaskans can have the fur um, and then they can make crafts out of it. You know, They can make uh, handmade art and things like that but they can't just tan a sea otter hide and sell it. It has to be worked into something. Uh, funny, this is kind of, I mean, given that polar bears are sort of an icon of uh, endangered species in some ways, uh, it's completely legal to keep a polar bear if you find it on land within a quarter mile of the beach. You could collect the bones, the teeth, uh, the skull, but you cannot have the claws and then you must register it. So uh, registering parts is done by the manager of the species. So uh, with, uh, uh, just to be sure about that, uh, polar bear would be the Fish and Wildlife Service. They would, they would register the parts of walrus polar bears and uh, the National Marine Fisheries would register parts from other animals. So you just call them. Um, I have the numbers, you know, contact numbers. Um, and uh, set up an appointment. Somebody might come to your house or they might ask you to bring it in. Um, obviously this is much easier in Fairbanks and Anchorage and Juneau uh, where they have offices, but they can work out arrangements for, um, for people that are in other areas. And uh, you register the parts. Um, when I collected the parts of that humpback whale, I, uh, I talked to them and they basically just gave me a, a number and I wrote it on a tag and that's my registered part. Um, the, the problem with some of these things is there is a black market for animal parts. Um, you know, you've probably heard, you know, there's Chinese medicine and uh, traditional medicine, much of which is not uh, really effective. Uh, you know, it's kind of a myth that if you, that ground up uh, rhinoceros horn is a uh, aphrodisiac, things like that. But there is, there is a real market for this stuff. And so polar bear claws, brown bear gallbladders, uh, things like that, uh, there's a black market for them. And so while you might find a dead polar bear and and want to collect the claws, uh, and that's harmless. And uh, 
uh, National Marine Fisheries Enforcement Officer or a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Enforcement Officer might, you know, understand and believe you, uh, because of the problem with the international trade in animal parts, uh, they're just off limits. Um, and so there's some pretty good articles and books about this uh, topic. And it's, it's a funny thing. And, and you know, every once in a while in the news, you'll, you'll hear about uh, you know, some ivory ring getting caught where people are shooting elephants and, and cutting the tusks off of them and leaving the rest of them to rot or shooting rhinos and cutting the uh, horns off of them and things like that. So that's a lot of the reason why they have these kind of funny um, exceptions. So walrus, uh, native people, of course, can take all parts of walrus and use them, um, but non-native people can collect bones, teeth, and ivory. Uh, and again, this has to be beached. It can't be floating. It has to be on the beach, and it needs to be registered with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, so one of the things that happens in, uh, is that people inherit stuff or people um, are, get the opportunity, you know, they're offered, uh, somebody offers to give you something. Um, there's a restaurant in Central Oregon that's got, you know, a million stuffed animals in it. And uh, it's incredible. It's the, uh, what do you, it's a cafe of dead things, I think we called it. It's, uh, it's like almost like a museum. There's so many mounts and things in there. Um, but we at Fish and Game here, and it comes to me, is, is uh, there's probably been five or six incidents where people have called up and said, uh, yes, uh, um, and said, I am downsizing. I have a bear rug, and I'd like to donate to Fish and Game. And so we'll do a transfer of possession, and, and we'll, you can do that. Um, so uh, the Fish and Wild or the National Fisheries Enforcement, NOAA Enforcement, would have to deal with uh, the animals they enforce. Uh, but you can you can give things to people, and um, you know people you could hunt uh, like this thing about polar bears. Uh, up until, this is from the very first hunting regulations when Alaska became a state, but up until about 1972, um, you could hunt polar bears. I mean, non-native people, non-residents, you could hunt one polar bear a year. Um, and anything except a cub or a female accompanied by cubs. So people do have polar bears. We have a polar bear rug here at Fish and Game that we take into schools and do, it's not a rug, it's just a tanned hide. But uh, uh, we, all of these, um, in fact, this, uh, this stuffed martin here was donated. This, these martin's furs were donated. We have a uh, uh, mountain goat that was donated to Fishing Game. Um, we have taxidermy ducks and things like that that were donated. So people can donate things. Um, you can't sell them. Uh, but there are a couple of exceptions to that. Um, like when the people that own that restaurant in Central Oregon and die or close it and move on and somebody winds up inheriting a whole bunch of taxidermy things, uh, there are avenues, I don't know about Oregon specifically, but in Alaska, there are avenues when an estate is in probate for some of that stuff to be sold. There's also a provision that if a taxidermist, um, if somebody abandons something, either before it's the taxidermy work is done or after they can sell it. So there's a permit through Fish and Game uh, in Alaska for taxidermists to sell things like that. Um, there's also, you know, kind of a special situation that happens in January in Anchorage where hides and um, things that were confiscated by the state wildlife troopers for legal reasons can be sold. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a few exceptions of where things might be sold and be available. Um, so birds are kind of in a, uh, their own separate category, uh, oddly. Uh, birds are completely protected. So 
even though lots of people, you know, find a feather from a songbird and uh, might want to keep a beautiful cobalt blue stellar jay feather, uh, technically you're not allowed to have bird feathers from songbirds or um, raptors. Uh, and again, the, the reason for that is because there is a black market for them. In fact, there was a guy here in Juneau who was shooting stellar jays and selling them to feather collectors in China. And he was doing other illegal things as well, which put him on the radar of law enforcement and he was eventually busted. Uh, but that was part of what he was doing was you know, shooting songbirds and selling their feathers uh, to feather collectors. Uh, there's a huge international market for butterflies. And, you know, people are going down to, collectors will go down to South America and Central America and catch all kinds of butterflies and sell them for uh, a lot of money uh, to collectors in, in Asia and, you know, overseas. Um, so, that is why they're protected. Obviously, you know, that's the intent and the letter of the law. But, um, you know, if you have a uh, stellar J feather, the FBI is probably not going to come and get you. Um, you know, half the people in Juno have eagle feathers they picked up and uh, law enforcement is not going to go after them unless they sell them or unless <clears throat> they're sort of forced to. And a, an artist in Juno was creating, uh, was doing carvings and doing artwork, and he was putting eagle feathers in it. And he didn't know it was illegal because he told a reporter for the newspaper who was covering his art show that he was doing it. And so the FBI came and uh, checked out his art exhibit and they confiscated everything. Uh, I don't think he was charged. I think they just took his stuff and they um, they educated him on what was and wasn't legal. Um, it's not legal for Native Americans or Native Alaskans to sell those things either, but they can possess them. So, um, you know, law enforcement has bigger fish to fry than, you know, taking eagle feathers away from people who have one tucked under their um, visor in their car or, or you know, on their mantle, uh, but there is, because there is this illegal market for it, it becomes an issue. Um, same is true with bird nests and eggs. Nests and eggs are also protected. So uh, there are lots of exceptions. Le feathers from legally hunted waterfowl are completely legal to possess. Um, they can't be sold except for fly tying. So if you go into a fly tying shop or a fly fishing shop, you'll see feathers everywhere, feathers for sale everywhere. And that was a provision that was worked into it, you know, decades ago, um, that it's okay to sell them for fly tying purposes. Um, and uh, it's, you know, but it's certainly legal to, to possess them and, and give them away. Uh, feathers from state managed upland game birds, which in Alaska would be grouse and ptarmigan, are completely okay to, to pick up and keep. And they're also okay for hunters to keep. Um, and as I said, for you know places like Oregon where or other states that have pheasant, quail, and chuckers and things like that, they are also legal to keep and have. Uh, and feathers from any domestic bird, uh, chickens, peacocks, pets, uh, parakeets, pigeons, finches, canaries, all of that, that's all legal. So every state has a clean list of animals that are legal to keep as pets or as domestic, you know, farm animals. It's that's managed by the state. I mean, in <clears throat> in Texas, you can have a tiger. In Florida, Florida and Texas, a lot of states have extremely liberal laws about what animals can be kept as pets. Um, Alaska, I think, because we came into the union. Uh, late and learn from other mistakes, we are fairly conservative, but it's still a pretty generous list if you look at it. Um, um, I can give you the link for that. Um, you can Google Alaska clean list um, for that. And uh, a lot of uh, basically anything that's on that clean list is legal uh, to have the bones of or the skin of or the parts of. So uh, and one of the final things is 
when I talked to the law enforcement and the folks, um, they said that hands down the most common problem that happens is people do things, non-native people do things that would be legal for native people to do, like create a piece of artwork um, or have an eagle feather. Um, and often it's, it's innocently done. Um, sometimes it's done commercially and those are the people that generally get arrested and charged. Um, in fact, they always do if they get caught um, when people are trying to sell things commercially. Um, and, um, and that happens in gift shops. And a lot of times they try to pass them off as native made when they're not uh, because they know what they're doing is not, is not legal. So um, that is basically the long and short of it. Um, I want to thank the folks that you know, provided me with the information and to Kelly and uh, Nicole for, for having me. And um, if there's any, uh, and you know, also all the people that uh, provided pictures, um, and I can take some questions. Um, I will um, put up this uh, list of uh, um, contacts um, and uh, websites and things I've got here. Um, you know some of those handouts that you saw that I put up uh, are available to download as PDFs. Um, there's articles and things I've written about, you know, the bear sealing process, um, how to, you know, the article that I wrote on this topic, how to clean a skull. There's things on that. Um, Alaska Sea Grant has a free publication in their bookstore, Collecting Dead Marine Mammal Parts While Beachcombing. It's an excellent uh, brochure that covers all of this. Um, there's the clean list there. Uh, we, Fish and Game has a Skulls of Alaska guide, um, and you can learn a lot more about skulls. And um, then I have the call, the con, I'll wait just a minute and then I'll put up the uh, list of contacts so you can get the numbers and uh, websites for how you would contact like National Marine Fisheries or um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement to uh, get parts registered or ask questions. Uh, so, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Thank you. I know that the. the the short answer is kind of in the beginning with uh, with what 90% of what most people are interested in is, um, you know, finding shed antlers um, and then skulls and bones of, you know, the most common Alaska wildlife. And so that is, that is legal. So for the most part, and I think people are surprised, you know, they, they're they concerned that, that it might be illegal to do something because they know that there are laws about it. And uh, so it's nice to know that, you know, if you find that kind of stuff, you can certainly keep it and have it and display it and give it away. Hey, O'Reilly, um, I think there's one thing about antlers too that people should know. Mm -hmm. If you're bringing them over the Canada, the Canada border that um, shed antlers, I think are okay, but if they're not shed, then they will get confiscated at the Canadian border, I believe. That's the way that it goes. And that's not, that's that's not a just a Alaska law or anything. That's a international one. You know anything about that? You know, it's a really good point. So um, the CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, C-I-T-E-S, CITES is um, kind of what is the international overview uh, that border people I came, I went over to Whitehorse and friends of mine over there that are trappers gave me the heads of um, a lynx, a fox, and a wolf that they had legally trapped. And they had done all the paperwork, um, including the CITES paperwork for me to take it over the border. And so when I got to the border outside of Skagway and declared it, they freaked out. I mean, they brought me inside and I was interrogated for an hour about why I had this stuff and what I was going to do with it. And 
uh, I think they were just freaked out that I had skinned animal heads. And I mean, it was like, it was like I had a human cadaver or something. They were completely freaked out. And I was like, I'm, I got on the ferry like 30 seconds before it left. And I mean, they just would not give up. You know, I mean, it was just like they asked me the same questions over and over and over again. And uh, so I definitely uh, push their buttons, you know, and all I did was like, hey, I got this stuff. It's legal. I'm just declaring it. Yeah. Slow day at the border. That's kind of how I felt, too. Um, at the end of it, you know, halfway through it, half the people were rolling their eyes and kind of going, let him go, let him go. And but the head guy, he just he just was not happy with me. Uh, so I'm not sure, you know, I noticed that, um, there are some very convoluted things in the regs about some in the Alaska hunting regs about some antlers that can be possessed in some hunts, as long as they have, uh, the peduncle, you know, the base of it, uh, or they're in some cases they have to be sawed off the skull and they can't be part of the skull. So I'm not sure how that would work. I mean, I'm not sure technically what that comes down to at the border. Um, but obviously, you know, tons of people in the Southeast drive to the interior to hunt and come back across the border with a dead moose or caribou. Um, so it's, it's a, that in itself is a very common thing. Um, but coming across the border with you know, just a shed antler. Uh, I mean, it's legal to have, and it, it's, I think it's, I'm sure it's legal to even pick up in Canada uh, if you got it in Canada. Uh, but I don't know, that would, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll look into that. Uh, so let's see, there's a question here about uh, sealing. If a person has a skull that was found or picked several years ago uh, and now requires sealing, um, yeah, you could get it sealed. If you if you if somebody gave you a brown bear skull years ago and you have it and you want to get it sealed, just take it in to um, the local fish and game office and tell them that you found it. And it's a, a complimentary seal, they call it, but they will seal it for you. Um, and wolf, a wolf doesn't need to be sealed. Um, a doll sheep would be. Um, you definitely need to get it sealed if you leave the state with it. Um, so that would be the kind of thing that, like, if you're going through Canada, that they would look for. Um, but it doesn't cost anything. Uh, Riley, I have a, a question. Um, what is one of the coolest animals that you've had the privilege of working with to collect skulls or other parts of? <laughs> um, well, there's a, that's, what is your favorite? Well, my favorite, there's a lot of cool. I mean, when I figured out that uh, halibut stomachs will have um, octopus beaks in them that was kind of cool so then i kind of got on a little let's cut open every halibut stomach and see it because they digest everything but the beak and an octopus beak looks like a bird beak it's it's a very cool little animal part um you know bears are bears are really cool um and and cleaning that bear skull was a very cool i've cleaned a black bear and a brown bear and um you know when you get your hands dirty cleaning them. I mean, it's, it's a very cool thing because you're, you really get, uh, you get to a close look at it. And, and it's amazing. I mean, you see like the little tiny holes at the back of the orbital where the eye goes, where the nerves go through and little holes in the jaws where the nerves go through. And it, you learn a lot about um, how animals work and why, you know, why bears have an incredible sense of smell because they have these enormous noses and uh, you know, why, why like a lynx or an animal, a cat has such great eyesight because they devote so much space in their cranium to that sense. Um, 
I think the whales, you know, kind of uh, take the cake. And my friend Clay Good is on here, and he was with me on a couple of uh, whale cleaning expeditions. And one, we a whale, a second humpback whale, washed up just south of Juneau, and we we really wanted this Alaska State Museum to to take it and worked hard with them to to see if we could set something up where they would uh, rearticulate and display it. Um, but they were in the middle of closing down the Alaska State Museum and building a new one. And it was just too much. It was just the timing was off. I think, you know, at a different time, they probably would have done it. Um, and that would have been an incredible project to be a part of, uh, you know, to take an entire mature humpback whale and do that. I know in Homer, I think they got a, a hold of a dead killer whale and a high school class buried it on the beach. And they, uh, you know, kind of took on this multi-year project of um, getting that thing completely decomposed and cleaned up and then re-articulated for display. Um, but <clears throat> just being able to, um, here, I'm gonna switch this if anybody wants to, oops. Um, get some of these numbers or contact information. Um, but, you know, just being up next to a dead whale, I mean, it's astonishing, you know, to, to be able to uh, be around something like that. I mean, they smell bad, but, 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 you know, so what? I mean, you know, if you've ever had kids and, you know, change diapers, you can deal with bad smells and, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's just a bad smell. But other than that, it's astonishing. I mean, you, you see it and, and, you know, to be around a dead whale that's fresh too, where they don't smell. And you're looking at this and it could be a part of a necropsy where, you know, you're helping people cut it open and pull out parts. I mean, uh, you know, we were, I would have been a part of a necropsy and they, uh, you know, this vet uh, from the Sea Life Center. Uh, I mean, she, she was cutting holes in this whale and, uh, you know, reaching in up to her elbow and feeling around and pulling stuff out and uh, pointing things out. And in fact, one of the things that she pointed out uh, grab it, that we got off that whale was, uh, this is the otolith of a humpback whale. So humpback whales have ears. Um, they obviously don't hear the same way we do. And their ear canal gets plugged with earwax. Um, very quickly when they're juvenile and seals up. Um, but they have a ear bone. I mean, this is, this is the densest bone in the animal kingdom. I mean, it's a solid chunk of calcium basically. Um, and yeah, and uh, I think when that whale, um, the second whale that uh, we checked out down on Douglas that the museum finally didn't take, um, you know, we, we knew that we waited till it decomposed and went and just kind of beachcombed and tried to find uh, find that particular bone and we found it. Uh, but they're all it's you know finding a a skull uh, with antlers like that 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 girl has on the very first slide that big that's that's an incredible thing to find too because it's just it's all clean and beautiful and you don't have to mess with it you just can take it home and um, hang it up. So those are very cool to find uh, as well. But uh, yeah, there's all kinds of, I didn't really set out to collect skulls. I just would find them and then get more opportunities. And, you know, those things kind of grow on you and pretty soon people are giving you stuff and calling you up saying, there's a great gray owl in my yard. It's dying. Can you come and get it? And it's like, yeah, I'll come and get it. <laughs> And that great gray owl is now in the Alaska State Museum. I mean, we, I got it, I put it in the freezer. And um, when they built a new state museum, um, the, one of the curators, Aaron Elmore called and said, we really want, we really want to get some owls. Do you have any owls? And I'm like, yeah, I do have an owl actually. And so they paid to have it, um, a mount done and it's on display there. They're looking for a mountain goat. That would be their dream to get a, a mountain goat and they would, they would have a taxidermist do a full body mount and they've got a spot they'd like to put it. So that's kind of in the back of my mind uh, if uh, an opportunity like that should ever come up. Oh, 
awesome. The life you've lived, the stories you can tell. <laughs> um, we have a couple more questions. Let's see here, if you have time, oh. I know we have eight o'clock. If you're willing to stick around and answer a couple more, um, then that would be great. But um, otherwise, if you have to jump off, we can have oh. um, these messages directly. But um, we, would you like me to read off a couple more? Uh, yeah, I see it here. Yeah. Uh, okay. A polar bear skull. Um, so does it have to be within a quarter mile of the shore? Or basically beyond a quarter mile from the shore? So it needs to be Go within... Ahead. It needs to be within a quarter mile of the of the shore, uh, and so which polar bear skull would be illegal? A skull sitting, yeah, correct. So it needs to be within a quarter mile of the shore. Um, I'm not sure why that is because they're marine mammals and they live. Uh, I'm sure that 95% of every of all the polar bears that die, um, die on sea ice and eventually wind up on the bottom of the ocean. Um, but if one was to die on the land, it would almost certainly be within a quarter mile of the, uh, of the ocean. I mean, they, they beachcomb, you know, they eat dead whales that wash up and things like that, but, but they're marine mammals. So they're, they're on the coast. Uh, but yeah, it's legal. I mean, it's, uh, be amazing. I'd love to get a polar bear skull uh, and kind of compare it to because they're so their heads are so much longer and narrower than brown bears. Um, I mean, they're very, very closely related to brown bears and they can interbreed with brown bears. I mean, they diverged from brown bears, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago. Uh, but the Arctic is such a intense environment that they evolve very quickly, obviously turning white. You know, there's tremendous selective pressure for an animal to be white in the Arctic. Um, and uh, their ears are tiny, you know, they're very good swimmers, they have huge feet. Um, so it would be legal to collect a, a polar bear within a quarter mile of the shore. Um, so this question here, what are the skulls behind me on the shelf? That is a giant brown bear. Um, that's the biggest brown bear skull I've ever seen. And this one belongs to fishing game. Um, the bear I have is probably two thirds the size. I mean, this this would have been an enormous, wow. you know, enormous bear. Um, so this this is the departments. Um, but uh, and then these are bear. Um, that's a from Glacier Bay. That's a bear uh, footprint. Uh, this is a raccoon from Oregon. This was roadkill. And I admit, I totally decapitated a roadkill raccoon and um, cleaned it up. Um, yeah, raccoons are awesome animals. Um, I really like raccoons. Um, that is an elk. Uh, And this is an otter. Um, it's a sea otter. Uh, this is a little bit of femo. I it didn't have the teeth, so I just made femo is like clay, you know, but it hardens. So I made a fake canine for it, just so it didn't look so like uh, a poor little otter without teeth. And uh, um, this is a pronghorn antelope that a friend of mine found in the desert in Oregon. This was the first skull that anybody gave me when I was in high school. Um, Vernus Slane, a friend of our families, found that in the desert. And uh, so animals with horns, you know, they keep their horns all year round. They don't shed. So it's got its, it's got all its, uh, the base of the horn. That's the vertebrae from that humpback whale. And, uh, and then these are just all shed antlers. Um, Got a bunch of shit antlers. Uh, 
And then ducks, you know, it's funny. That's a duck. Um, and then there's a couple over here that um, this taxidermist in Texas um, called up a year ago and said, I'm, I'm retiring. And I used to come up to Alaska every year and hunt ducks. I have a whole bunch of ducks in my shop that are on display and I'm retiring and I want to mail them back to Alaska. And you guys can fish and game can have them. And I mean, that thing was in a crate. It, it must have cost $100 to mail it um, and, and get it protected and everything. But it arrived and it's beautiful. And he was an incredible taxidermist. I mean, when you look at a lot of taxidermy, it's an amazing art to get, um, to make them lifelike. And, and we have, you know, we have 25 mounted ducks and things here in the fish and game office. And um, we loan them out to teachers for classrooms. And a lot of art teachers will borrow our birds and use them for still life, you know, drawing classes and stuff. Um, but this guy uh, is by far the best taxidermist for birds that I've, that I know of. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't have, you know, mounted birds uh, in my house, but um, uh, they're, you know, I think ducks are beautiful, especially um, wood ducks and harlequins, things like that. Um, yeah, and appreciate the art for sure and the work that goes into it. Um, we had one direct question um, that was directed over to myself. So are the number of kills listed or published somewhere? Is there a collection of photos for them? Um, that came from someone named Amber. So if Amber's still on the call, maybe she'd want to um, go in depth into that if she's willing. But um, if that sounds, if you know what she's referring to, then by all means, jump on in. <laughs> the number of kills? Yeah. Um, Amber still, I see somebody named Amber still on, but I'm not sure she'd be able to point it out. But um, yeah, that's all I have. Hmm. And is there a no photos for them? And how many animals were killed per year? Followed up. Killed like, uh, like by hunters? Um, I could ask her. Um, are there photos or are they listed online? Is there a repository or archival? And she said, yes, I think potentially referring to, as you were mentioning last year in general. Um, there, it depends on the animal. Um, some animals like, um, like doll sheep, um, because they have to be uh, sealed, um, we know exactly how many are killed every year. Mountain goats the same way. Um, it's it's much more closely monitored. Um, there's no pictures taken of them or anything like that. But um, there, uh, we could tell you exactly how many doll sheep were killed and where they were killed um, in any given year. And you can look that up. I mean, it's on our website. You can go to the Fish and Game website and look up harvest data under the hunting section of the website, and you can find out. Uh, for any animal that we have the information on, uh, bison would be another one. We keep that information. You could find out what, you know, by year and by location, uh, how many animals were killed. For something like deer, moose, and caribou, because so many are taken, um, I mean, people harvest about 8,000 moose a year, probably 25,000 caribou are harvested. Uh, there's just, you know, we don't, and we don't require any, uh, anybody to register that or uh, report specifics that would be uh, recorded in that way. I mean, we collect information for management purposes, but there's just so many, you know, of that, that it's not something that would be specifically done. Um, 
but you can look if you go to a, the fishing game website and look you know or then search you can find there's a lot of stuff you can look up specifically about uh, numbers uh, cool yeah yeah awesome great um the last question i can see was mentioned our it was directed to myself as well again um are there options to tranquilize or are there regulations to um tranquilize to avoid hunting to remove antlers teeth etc to tranquilize an animal and move it um i believe to avoid hunting the animal could you um tranquilize an animal to remove like antlers or teeth or other parts versus killing the animal. I've um, never thought of that before. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> it's that's a really tricky thing. I mean, that's a good question, actually, because uh, people see animals, um, you know, that, uh, you know, like are tangled up in stuff uh, and they want they want fishing game to help. And sometimes we can. I mean, there are some situations where uh, if it's possible to catch an animal and like uh, help it, we will do that. Uh, obviously, it's a little different if it's a grizzly bear or a brown bear or something. I mean, you know, there's a whole different story to catch a, you know, 500 pound brown bear that has a loop of rope tied around its neck and is running around and obviously needs help. But, uh, and, uh, and it's tricky to, to dart an animal uh, that's just running loose, you know. I mean, you can sometimes tranquilize an animal that's that's been, you know, like trapped in a house or in a corral or something. But you know, you can't just necessarily chase down a uh, a wild animal and shoot it with a dart gun. Um, but in the bigger picture, I know that in Africa uh, they have tranquilized rhinos and cut off their horns so that they lose any value to a poacher. They do it with elephants. They cut off their tusks and let them go. And then, and it, and then poachers aren't gonna shoot them because there's no value to them. I mean, it seems very weird to me and extreme, but it, it saves their lives. I mean, it really, it's, it works. Um, there have been in Alaska, there have been a couple of kind of funny situations like um, in Skagway, there was a glacier bear, um, a white colored black bear that was running around town and people wanted to have it protected so that uh, that specific animal was off limits to hunting. And, uh, you know, fish and game is set up to manage populations of animals, not protect individual animals. Um, but it's it we certainly appreciate why people would do that and and why people would want to save a very unique animal. Uh, but it's also kind of a hard thing to enforce because an animal like that, a, a white black bear might get, you know, it might look gray in sunlight or even very dark in certain light. Um, and maybe in full sunlight, it looks white, but it, in, in dusk, if it's a little dirty, it doesn't. And a hunter might shoot it and go, well, it was all covered with mud. I can't, it's not my fault, you know? And so it becomes hard to enforce some of those things around very specific animals. Uh, but there have been times where I think exceptions have been made and they've, you know, the board of game or um, uh, wildlife managers have tried to make exceptions uh, when it's possible. Uh, it's just it's just a lot trickier uh, to actually execute sometimes those things and pull them off. Uh, and as far as animals, you know, protecting animals like like orphaned cubs or kittens, you know, it's very uh, we can't just necessarily capture if a lynx mother gets run over and she has kittens we can't necessarily just capture them and give them to the Alaska Zoo because they already have a couple of links and there may not be any zoos that can take links or that are interested in or want them. It happens all the times with bears. 
black bears are so common in North America that every zoo that wants a black bear has a black bear. You can't give them away. Uh, sometimes you can find a home for brown bears, but even then it's very difficult uh, to find a, a licensed legal facility that is fully capable of taking care of a bear and just go, okay, we're gonna mail this to the Cleveland Zoo. Uh, but we try if we can. And, and we have a biologist yeah. who's part of that person's job is keeping on top of every licensed zoo and wildlife facility that might be interested in taking uh, a moose calf or something and um, finding a home if, if there is a opportunity. Wow, that's super cool. I have a dream job. <laughs> um, I think that wraps up the questions that we had that I received and that I can see. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording point.